The NHL 2013 draft was a class of a lot of contributors and role players, especially in the top 15. A lot of players in the first round have become fixtures to their teams as top line players. Not a class deemed to have surprises in the first round, but seem to be consistent with how well they performed. Last time, we took a look at one of the most underwhelming classes in recent memory. I don't expect this video to get as much reception as the previous, but it seems that a lot of people enjoy what I have to say. This is how I'll be grading each pick. This time, I wanted to include an S tier level as I didn't have it on my 2012 first round draft ratings. Nothing too different, just means that they are, if not, one of the best players in our generation. Again with the disclaimer, I am in no means an expert in rating these picks. It's just my opinion on how I feel about these players. I would like to hear your own thoughts in the comments below. Now enough talking, let's dive right into grading the NHL 2013 first round draft class. Nathan McKinnon was the consensus first overall pick. His NHL career actually began with some struggles and perseverance. His first season saw promise as he won the Calder Trophy as Rookie of the Year. The next three years in the league would find McKinnon with some struggles, producing at a rate of 40 to 50 points. At this point, critics and hockey fans deemed him to be an underwhelming first overall pick and not living up to his draft selection. But little would people know, he would come back with style, scoring over a point per game in his next six years in the league including this past season where he would score 111 points. He has won Stanley Cup and is arguably one of the best playoff performers of our generation, scoring 100 points in just 77 games. If he wasn't often injured, he would easily be a 100 point producer. He's an example of a player that overcame adversity, not by working out twice as hard or practicing during the offseason, but by putting his mind in the right place and increasing his confidence in the game absolutely belongs into the Hockey Hall of Fame once his time is done in the NHL. When the Florida Panthers selected Alexander Barkov as the second overall pick, it was a surprise given the track record with GM Dale Talon, selecting based on positional need. Hockey fans every year seem to agree that Barkov is one of the most underrated players of our current generation. A complete number one center who always plays a very smart defensive role proving it by winning the Selkie Trophy as the best defensive forward in the 2021 season, as he is often a top 10 finalist every single year. 96 points in his best season, he also has won the Lady Bing Trophy as the most gentleman-like player in the league. When his time in the NHL is done, he will most likely be a Hall of Fame player. Jonathan Drouin was a player who had a high hockey IQ and as much upside as Nathan McKinnon. Some questions from him coming into the draft was if he really was capable of translating his skill as his transition in the NHL would not be too smooth. Having tensions with this team in his first couple years which got him traded to the Montreal Canadiens. His best offensive output was 53 points, reaching that tally twice. His NHL career as it stands has not been what you expect from a third overall pick. As of July 2023, he will be playing for the Colorado Avalanche. For a third overall pick, he was a letdown, but at his peak, he was a solid second line player. Seth Jones, son of former NBA player Popeye Jones. He was a consensus second overall pick coming into the NHL draft, earning Rookie of the Year with 56 points in the Western Hockey League. He fell down to number 4 not because of anything he did, as teams before him were drafting by position. In his prime, he was a top-line defenseman, producing 57 points for the Columbus Blue Jackets. His reputation in the league is that he has one of the worst contracts in the league, earning $9.5 million and producing at a rate of 30 to 40 points. This upcoming season may change once the team continues to improve. If we were to pass over his expensive contract, he is actually a decent player. Elias Lindholm son of former NHLer Mikael Lindholm. He was said to be a complete package with very little to no holes in his game and a player who could force turnovers. Unfortunately, he didn't perform to expectations when he was with the Hurricanes and was traded to the Flames after 5 years in the league. In his time with the Calgary Flames, he thrived nearly immediately, producing high offensive numbers with his best tally of 82 points. He is also a player who gets voted as the best defensive forward even being a finalist behind Patrice Bergeron in the 21-22 season. A solid pick. 
Sean Monahan was voted as one of the smartest players in the OHL before his draft. He actually performed with better expectation when he made the NHL. During his peak, he scored 82 points and was a consistent 60-point producer. Sadly, injuries have caused a massive decline in his career, playing less in each season. But for his overall performance, he was a solid pick. Darnell Nurse comes from a family of athletes. Nurse is a good two-way defenseman who is very useful on both the power play and the penalty kill, and someone who can eat minutes on the blue line, but he is often overshadowed by an expensive contract at $9.25 million per season. His highest point production came when he garnered 43 points this past season, an overall solid blue liner in the league. Rasmus Ristolainen is a big mobile defenseman who played solid minutes as a top D-man for the Buffalo Sabres, producing at a rate of 40 to 50 points during his prime. He however has been in question about having poor advanced analytics when it comes to his play on the ice, having one of the worst plus-minus ratios in the NHL with an astounding minus 176, 41 more than the second worst active player. For what he provides on the blue line, he is an okay pick but is often overshadowed by an expensive contract that many fans tend to agree is not the best. An okay pick. This selection originally belonged to the New Jersey Devils before it was traded to the Vancouver Canucks for Corey Schneider. The pick would turn out to be Bo Horvat, a solid two-way forward who would eventually become the captain of the Vancouver Canucks, producing his best tally this past season with 70 points split between the Canucks and the New York Islanders. It is unfortunate he is no longer with the team, but regardless of that, a pretty solid pick. Valery Nichushkin has one of the best redemption stories in recent memory. His first several years found him struggling in the league. Three years into his NHL season, he would leave for the KHL in Russia. When he returned, he would struggle immensely, scoring zero goals in 57 games. His career would come into question until he was traded to the Colorado Avalanche, where his production would finally improve. His past two seasons saw him playing top-line minutes, producing 99 points in 115 games, with his highest tally of 52 points in 62 games, even winning a Stanley Cup as a top contributor scoring 15 points. For what he was early on, it seemed like he may have been a bust, but he would make up for it within the last couple years, a solid example of being put in a right situation and thriving. Samuel Moran is a physical and competitive player. When drafted, the Flyers were looking to rebuild the back end by adding the 6'6 defenseman as he was one of the highest risers in the draft. Unfortunately, he did not perform to expectations, playing in a total of 29 games in his career. A miss in the draft. Max Domi, son of former NHLer Ty Domi. Max was selected by the Phoenix Coyotes. An interesting fact. It would mark three straight years that the Coyotes would select a son of a former NHL player in the first round. Max Domi is known for his grit style play like his father, but enormously better and faster in every way, producing 72 points in his best season as a Montreal Canadian. In recent years, Domi has been a journeyman, playing for five different teams in the past five years, having some ups and downs but has thrived in many instances. As of July 2023, he will be playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs, a solid player in the league. Josh Morrissey coming into the draft was projected to go anywhere between 15 to 30, so it was a surprise when he was selected 13th overall by the Winnipeg Jets. It was known that he was a skilled offensive defenseman, but what worried some scouts was if he was able to translate his size in the NHL. This past season, we saw an explosion in his offense, scoring 76 points in 78 games and was a contender to win the Norris Trophy. Before that, he was a 30-point producer as a solid player on a blue line. We shall see where he ends up in the next couple of years, but for what he did this year, definitely worth the pick. The Columbus Blue Jackets selected Alex Wenberg. He was a player who had a strong two-way game, nothing over the top but a player who was dependable and adaptive as he was projected to be a third-line center. 59 points in his best offensive year. Since then, he's been around the league and is a reliable two-line player. A decent pick. 
Ryan Pulak was one of the hardest shooting defensemen left in the draft and is scouted as a very dependable and reliable player on the blue line. It took him nearly four years until he solidified his spot as a full-time player for the Islanders with his best tally of 37 points back in the 18-19 season. He solidifies the blue line as a second pairing defensive defenseman who can hit and block shots. A solid pick for his role. Nikita Zadorov was drafted as a 6'6 defenseman and had the longest wingspan second to Seth Jones. The big physical defenseman would perform decently in the NHL, producing 22 points in his best season. Overall, an average third pairing defenseman in the league. An okay pick. Curtis Lazar was a center who played in the same line as McKinnon with the Oil Kings in the minors. Scouts would point out that he is a very versatile player with all-around third-line potential. In the NHL, he would have his highest tally of 20 points in his sophomore season. He's played in six different teams and is a solid death player for his entire career. For a draft selection, he was an underwhelming pick, but still impressive that he is still in the league. An okay pick. The 18th overall draft pick was originally owned by the Detroit Red Wings. They would decide to trade down to 20 and add an additional pick from the San Jose Sharks. The Sharks would select Mirko Mueller. He was drafted as a complete defenseman. Unfortunately, he would find his struggles to maintain a spot in the league, producing 11 points in his most productive year as a New Jersey Devil and has been out of the league since the 2019-20 season. An underwhelming pick. The 19th overall pick was originally a New York Rangers pick, but was traded to the Columbus Blue Jackets for Rick Nash. And the Blue Jackets would select Kirby Ryko, son of former NHLer Warren Ryko. Unfortunately, he would not last long in the league, with his most points coming with 9, never playing more than 32 games in a season. Given that this pick involved the Blue Jackets giving away their franchise player and having it not pan out, it makes this selection a massive disappointment. Anthony Mantha was selected by the Detroit Red Wings. He was the only 50 goal scorer in the draft, a solid offensive player in juniors. A smart move for the Red Wings to move down a few picks as the San Jose Sharks selection didn't pan out. Mantha had solid potential as in his prime, he could produce at a pace of 50 to 60 points in a season, even having potential of scoring 70 points. But unfortunately, he was derailed by many injuries playing in less time this past season for the Washington Capitals. Until he can prove that he can have a bounce back season, this would be considered an okay pick. The Toronto Maple Leafs would select big center Frederick Gauthier. He was a player that needed improvement on his offense but was rated very high in his defensive game. He would never really find his footing in the NHL, playing in parts of 7 seasons in the league with the most points tallying 14 points, an underwhelming pick. The 22nd overall selection was a pick that the Calgary Flames acquired by trading away Jay Bowmeister to the St. Louis Blues. They would select Emile Poirier as an off-the-board pick, projected to be picked between 40 to 50 by some scouts. He would never make an impact in the league, as he only played in 8 NHL games in his entire career. Given that Bowmeister became a solid defenseman for the Blues until his retirement, this will make the Flames pick not worth it overall. Andre Burakovsky, son of former hockey player Robert Burakovsky. Drafted as a skilled offensive player, he has been a good contributor as a deaf player in his first five years in the league, scoring 20 to 30 points in a season. It wasn't until he was traded to the Colorado Avalanche was when he would take his game to the next level producing at a rate of 60 to 70 points a season, but injuries would prevent him from garnering more points, with his highest tally of 61 points in the 21-22 season. In his career, he's won two Stanley Cups, one with the Capitals as a death player, and one with the Avalanche as a top contributor. As of today, he plays for the Seattle Kraken, a solid player all around. Hunter Shikarik was drafted with solid potential offensive abilities. His numbers in juniors dropped off during his draft year but was still looked at as a decent player with upside and terrific balance with the puck. Unfortunately, 
he would only play in two seasons for a total of 15 games in the league. Not worth the pick. Michael McCarron coming into the draft was the most penalized player in the juniors and was projected to be an early second round pick. Standing at 6 feet 6, Montreal was in need for grit and height for their offensive lineup. Unfortunately, he wouldn't have a permanent fixture in the league, spending most of his time in the AHL. But he never gave up and as of this past season, is a death player for the Nashville Predators. An underwhelming pick. Shea Theodore was a solid offensive defenseman coming into the draft. A little off the board pick, projected to be in the second round. He spent two years with the Anaheim Ducks until he was chosen by the Vegas Golden Knights in the expansion draft. That's where his career would explode, becoming a solid two-way defenseman in the league. Unfortunately, he is overshadowed by current teammate Alex Petrangelo, another solid blue liner on the team. A massive steal for the Golden Knights acquiring him basically for free. Marco Dano was a reach of a pick as he was ranked within the top 50 prospects of this draft. He made a splash when he made his debut in the NHL, scoring 21 points in 35 games. 14 of those points actually came in the last 15 games he played. Unfortunately, he would be traded away and his play was never the same since. That'll be his highest point totals in his career, playing his last game in the 2019-20 season. Besides his solid rookie season, he didn't make much of an impact. An unfortunate turn in his career. This final first round draft pick from the Calgary Flames was acquired by trading Jerome Nguyenla to the Pittsburgh Penguins. With the Flames now in rebuild mode, they would select Morgan Klimchuk, a good complementary player who could play in any situation he's given. Unfortunately, another player who made little to no impact in the league, playing in one game for the Flames. Not worth the pick sadly. Jason Dickinson was selected by the Dallas Stars as they would acquire this draft pick from the Boston Bruins for the trade of Yarmir Yager. He was drafted as a very skilled skater, a soft player overall but had a good hockey sense. In the NHL, he was a solid death player who can produce 15 to 20 points. This past season, he would score all-time highs, producing 30 points for the Chicago Blackhawks. A decent selection as a late first round pick. With the last selection in the first round, the Stanley Cup champions, the Chicago Blackhawks, selected Ryan Hartman. Described as a Brad Marchand type of player, Hartman plays a grit style game who hits and fights like a power forward. He was voted as one of the highest agitators in the draft. His first several seasons in the league saw him have a row as a third and fourth line player, producing 20 to 30 points in a season. Then, in the 21 22 season, Hartman would score an all time high 34 goals and 65 points, surpassing his all time points records. This past season saw him garner injuries, but he still scored at a pace of over 50 points. If he continues to have high production within the next couple of years, his ranking can definitely go up, but for now, a solid player overall. Going over all the selections in the draft, you can see that the first 15 were solid picks as many of them are now in their primes. Once you get to the 16th pick, the later selections would begin a massive decline in skill, which drops the overall grading for the 2013 first round draft class. Some notable players selected in the later rounds include Jake Gensel, Anthony Duclair, Brett Pesci, and even goalies such as Yusei Saros and Tristan Jari. Overall, this draft class has solid contributors in today's game. I hope you enjoyed this list. If you have not already, please do check out how I graded the previous draft class of 2012. It was definitely an interesting draft with many massive disappointments and surprises. If you enjoyed these type of videos and want to see more, please consider liking and subscribing for more content. And I'll see you next time as we dive into the 2014 draft class.